Boa tarde, uh, bem-vindos ao Teatro do Bairro Alto, eu chamo Ana Bigot Vieira e faço parte da equipa de programação do TBA. A menos de um mês da última apresentação do ciclo Histórias do Experimental, a conferência O Outro Teatro, Teatro Experimental em Portugal, por André E. Teodósio, que está disponível online, está a ter finalmente lugar um conjunto de eventos de que eu muito gosto, que há muito vinha com vontade de propor e que foram já por duas vezes adiados, passando finalmente ao online. Trata-se dos seminários Arquivos Comuns, ontem às 15h e às 16h45, que vos convido desde já a ver, também estão disponíveis online, e instituições estas outras, agora, possíveis também graças ao apoio do Instituto Cervantes e do Centro de Estudos de Teatro da Universidade de Lisboa, a quem agradeço. Juntos, e em diálogo com outros eventos anteriores, estes eventos continuam um percurso que temos vindo a fazer no TBA em torno de ideias e genealogias do experimentalismo com vista a melhor compreender o momento presente. Assim, se por um lado nas conferências de ontem, sábado, o foco foi no arquivo, nos arquivos e no que neles pode haver de comum, pertença coletiva de um passado múltiplo e muito importante contestado, na mesa redonda de hoje, domingo, o foco é sobre instituições, pois é por elas e com elas que uma série de práticas políticas, estéticas e existenciais concretas se transmitem. Trabalhando hoje sobre o passado de uma forma, de uma forma não nostálgica, aímos os projetos à ação institucional, seja de uma institu instituição como o Museu Reina Sofia, em Madrid, no primeiro caso, seja da Universidade de Veneza e do Centro Social Saledox, no segundo caso, é separável de uma vontade crítica de transformação do contemporâneo, desenhando presentes e futuros outros. A sessão de hoje também será dupla, desta vez sem intervalo, em formato de mesa redonda e com uma discussão única no final em que se falará das duas apresentações. Vamos. Gostaria de avisar também que esta conversa está a ser gravada, sendo posteriormente divulgada no site e nas redes do Teatro do Bairro Alto, onde, aproveito para anunciar, se encontram também alguns excertos de textos que servem de apoio a aos vários seminários, com as respectivas ligações para a bibliografia mais aprofundada. No final, vamos abrir para a conversa, estando desde já convidados a participar por chat no Zoom, YouTube ou Facebook. Eu vou recolher as questões que lerei alto quando houver oportunidade. Passo a apresentar os intervenientes, que tenho o maior gosto em ter connosco e que gostaria de futuramente acolher em presença no TBA. Então, Sara Buraya Bonet trabalha no Departamento de Atividades Públicas do Museu Reina Sofia e integra o Museu en Rede, onde a sua investigação e o trabalho institucional são atravessados, eu acho que este atravessados é, um, é importante, <risos> pelo enfoque nos feminismos, nas políticas do cuidar, na nova institucionalidade, nos comuns urbanos, e no Arquivo e Memória dos Movimentos Sociais. Sara é coordenadora da Confederação Europeia de Museus de Internacional e membro editorial de Internacional Online. Integra também o IDI, Institute of Radical Imagination. Por sua vez, Marco Baravale é investigador do projeto InCommon da Universidade de Veneza, aliás tivemos a oportunidade ontem de o ouvir brevemente sobre isso, e é membro por isso hoje está cá, de Saledox, um coletivo independente que se dedica à relação entre arte, ativismo e gentrificação. Um, integra igualmente o IRI, Institute of Radical Imagination. Por último, para moderar a conversa, eu convidei Luís Silva, curador e diretor do Kunsthalle Lissabon, instituição que fundou com João Mourão em 2009. Para além da sua prática curatorial, Luís Silva foi co-editor da série de publicações Performing the Institutional. Muito obrigada e dou a palavra à Sara. Olá, boas tardes, boa tarde. Obrigada, Sana. Eh, muitas graças ao Teatro do Barrio Alto e em especial a Ana Bigote, que desde que nos conhecemos há um par de anos venimos intercambiando ideias e também sobre institucionalidade e também sobre as experiências em pandemia. Obrigada, Sana, por fazer o possível. Y también gracias al, al equipo técnico que hay detrás. Eh, voy a compartir mi mmm, pantalla. Bueno, os pido disculpas, no falo no portugués. Voy a hablar en español, hablaré lo más despacio y claro que sea posible. Eh, bueno, yo soy Sara Buraya, ya gracias por la presentación, Ana, trabajo, os, os hablo desde Madrid donde, y trabajo en el Museo Reina Sofía. 
una institución a la que estoy vinculada desde 2009, cuando empecé allí como estudiante, y he recorrido, bueno, he trabajado en dos de los departamentos, en el de colecciones, y trabajo en actividades públicas desde 2013, pero bueno, por decir que, digamos, allí he vivido todo un proceso de formación profesional, personal, institucional y también política. Y también soy por afuera de de la institución también participo y he participado en colectivos independientes, tanto de producción cultural, en distintos espacios de participación, colectivos feministas, centros sociales. ¿Y por qué hablo de lo que hago fuera de la institución? Porque creo que es relevante para la, el relato que os voy a contar, que tiene que ver con que las instituciones, a pesar de estar inscritas en un régimen jurídico, jurídico de X o en ciertos modos de producción que tienen una rigidez, una flexibilidad de X, también son a su vez eh, de instituciones, eh, son producidas por las personas que la habitan y esas personas están atravesadas por experiencias concretas y tienen apuestas vitales concretas. Y porque creo que la máxima de lo personal es político, también se puede aplicar a la apuesta institucional. Y también quería aclarar que lo que voy a contar no lo, no lo enuncio desde la institución museo ni representándola, sino que voy a hablar de mis experiencias personales y también todo lo que voy a contar es fruto de la reflexión a partir de prácticas institucionales, reflexión que no he hecho sola, sino que ha sido alimentada durante años por las personas que hemos ido pasando por este dispositivo del Museo en Red. A mis compañeras a las que doy las gracias y desde aquí saludo. El Museo Reina Sofía, voy a dar un poco de contexto, por, por si acaso alguna no lo conocéis, es el Museo Nacional Centro de Arte Reina Sofía, que es, un, eh, es una institución pública dependiente del Ministerio de Cultura y Deporte y que alberga la, la colección de arte contemporáneo de España. Es una institución a muy gran escala, con, en, en todos los sentidos, a nivel de espacios, a nivel de equipo, donde trabajamos muchísimas compañeras, tiene una colección de más de 23.000 obras, de la que su obra más icónica y representativa es el Guernica de Picasso, que probablemente conoceréis, y tiene bueno, líneas de trabajo ya muy asentadas, tanto de exposiciones como de colección, así como una importante línea de publicaciones y un departamento de actividades públicas que propone programaciones tanto en cine como artes en vivo, programas educativos y también programas académicos, y un po, es, es el departamento que alberga esta apuesta institucional del Museo en Red. Bueno, la imagen que veis aquí, he puesto también la dirección del microsite del Museo en Red para que podáis consultarla y esta es la imagen que hemos eh, elegido para que intente expresar también a partir de experiencias artísticas el proyecto institucional que os voy a contar. Y se trata de una imagen del libro de Suri Rolnik, Esferas de la Insurrección, en el que sale a cita de Moebius, que es una cita, una obra del artista Lilla Clark, Amiñando, de 1973. Algunas de las obras relacionales de Lilla Clark están en, el museo de, en, están en la colección del museo, y donde el artista corta un folio para crear esta figura matemática pensada para que el público lo haga a su vez, cortando el papel y creando un camino de dos reversos que en realidad terminan siendo el mismo. Y nos parece que habla de este tipo de, bueno, de, de la idea de las prácticas artísticas que aplicamos o que intentamos aplicar a la institucionalidad, que pasa por la performatividad, que pasa por lo colectivo, por el, la persona que la activa, que tiene que ver con con una genealogía y que es un constante hacer y deshacer entre muchas, ¿no? A ver, que no me deja pasar. Como os decía, Museo en Red es un área del departamento que viene desde hace 10 años estableciendo lazos y colaboraciones con distintas plataformas, tanto en el ámbito español, digamos, como a nivel internacional y con plataformas que son de distinta, digamos, de, de, de distinto ámbito de acción, no solamente relacionadas con las prácticas artísticas, que por supuesto también, sino con la construcción de pensamiento, con los espacios del activismo y y con, digamos, distintos tipos de construcciones institucionales. Entonces, se, se inscribe Museo en Red en prácticas y reflexiones que vienen, por supuesto, herederas de la crítica institucional de los 60, de los 70, ¿no? cuando artistas como Jaque, o Bureno, o Brodaer se empiezan a cuestionar las lógicas de la institución y que ha tenido una serie de olas en los 70, en los 90, 
Aquí, eh, bueno, había pensado, me gustaría mencionar eh, que la presentación de, de Analisa ayer, ¿no? en la que ella hablaba sobre la revolución basaliana, esa revolución institucional que Basal ya empieza en la ciudad de Trieste y que ha transformado su modelo institucional, es para nosotras y viene siendo desde hace años un impulso y un, un ejemplo muy movilizador que nos ha hecho ¿no? asumir también estas preguntas que se hacían en, en, en Trieste y con las, que, con las compañeras de Trieste colaboramos hace tiempo. También quería mencionar, porque ayer me quedo por decir eh, a Pancho Ramas que con, que con las, el equipo de allí de Trieste están creando ahora el archivo, el archivo del hospital psiquiátrico de San Giovanni, con el que tenemos también una relación de ida y vuelta. Eh, entonces, todas estas líneas, ¿no? que, líneas de fuerza que propone en el museo como un espacio de aprendizaje, como una, una, un archivo a activar, un foro público, un espacio de representación y de iniciación pública, eh, que de alguna manera trasciende ¿no? las tareas tradicionales de ese concepto de museo que albergaba y cuidaba una colección y la mostraba para activar un mecanismo, un dispositivo mucho más complejo. Entonces, si partimos de una institución pública como el Reina Sofía, basada en las nociones de patrimonio, de colección nacional, de lo público, nosotras intentamos plantearnos cómo conseguir que esa institución se abra, se deje atravesar y se transforme, y se deje interpelar por otras y por otros, eh, y se deje interpel interpelar por la noción de lo común, ¿no? a pesar de estar situada en esa, de alguna manera, identidad de lo público. Entonces voy a mostrar muy brevemente el ecosistema de redes en las que el museo participa, eh, con las que dialoga y sostiene esa relación desde hace más de 10 años, ese entramado que es relacional, que es afectivo, proyectivo, reflexivo, discursivo. Entonces haré este pequeño esbozo y después voy a ir pasando unas imágenes de dispositivos que hemos activado a lo largo de los años con estas redes, mientras voy enunciando bueno, una serie de, de reflexiones que quería eh, compartir con vosotras para después centrarme en dos casos específicos de, de estas redes que creo que pueden tender hilos con la conversación con Marco y con Saledox que podemos continuar eh, después. Que veo mi tiempo. La primera de ellas, bueno, estas redes tienen distintas escalas, como decía, y distintos ámbitos de actuación, también geopolítico, por decirlo de alguna manera. Museo Situado es una asamblea de asociaciones y del tejido asociativo del barrio de Lavapiés, que es el barrio de la ciudad de Madrid, donde el Museo Reina Sofía se ubica. Es, bueno, eh, se gestiona a partir de un proceso asambleario en el que el museo participa como una más, y destacaría que con el tiempo se, ha, este se inició en 2018 y Ana Longoni, que participó ayer, ha sido pues una de las impulsoras y quizá después de, en, la, en la fase de conversación quiera aportar algunas ideas, pero mi experiencia con esta red ha sido que nos ha permitido generar un dispositivo de escucha sensible que conecta al museo con lo que está sucediendo en el territorio de Lavapiés y que nos permite actuar ahí. La Fundación de los Comunes, que es uno de los casos que voy a desarrollar eh, más adelante, que se, es una plataforma, suena así como fundación, pero en realidad es una figura jurídica que, eh, que es como un paraguas de una serie de empresas políticas, de grupos de investigación, editoriales y espacios de autoformación en el territorio del Estado español, con distintos nodos a lo largo del Estado. El Instituto de Ima eh, la Internacionale, que es una confederación de siete instituciones de arte moderno y contemporáneo en el marco em europeo, que comparten una serie de valores comunes como la solidaridad, la diferencia y la comunalidad, y que vienen también desde hace diez, desde hace diez años cuestionando el rol de la institución museo y de la institución museo de arte contemporáneo, a partir de bueno, cuestionar también cuáles son y reconocer cuáles son las diferencias entre ellas, jurídicas, de escala, de posición, supone una toma de, de posición eh, de, este con, de este conjunto de instituciones. El Instituto de Imaginación Radical, que es una red formada por artistas, curadores, activistas, profesores y eh, abogados, bueno, es compleja, eh, tiene su ámbito de actuación, es el ámbito, digamos, mediterráneo y sureuropeo, 
y se dedica, bueno, tienen, todas estas personas tienen un interés compartido por la coproducción de conocimiento, la investigación artística y política y plantea una serie de intervenciones en sus distintos nodos en el Mediterráneo dirigidas a implementar formas de vida poscapitalistas. La red Conceptualismos del Sur, que ayer tuvimos el placer de conocer, que Ana ya explicó muy bien, eh, que es una red fundada en 2007 de investigadoras, de activistas eh, de ámbito latinoamericano, pero con también algunas personas en el Estado español y con la que el museo viene colaborando desde 2019 en proyectos como investigaciones, publicaciones, digitalización de archivos y, y su consolidación así como ciclos audiovisuales, seminarios, en, este, en esta idea de colaboración sostenida a lo largo de los años. Y la laboratoria, que es el segundo caso que trataré, que es una, digamos, una red de muy reciente creación destinada a generar recursos y espacio para proponer investigaciones de feministas, pero que tienen que ver con el ámbito, digamos, de la acción política feminista, que no está separada, no, no de ámbito académico, sino que tiene que ver con una praxis que genera un conocimiento específico que normalmente no tiene el tiempo ¿no? para, para la escritura, para la difusión y para la reflexión más sosegada. Y todo este es el ecosistema, digamos, en que en el de cooperación y colaboración del museo con estas redes. Entonces, ¿qué es el Museo en Red? No? Desde 2009 viene, el museo viene actuando en esta línea de manera más o menos intermitente, pero digamos que en los últimos 3-4 años se ha establecido como un espacio de trabajo fijo y específico porque tiene unas particularidades el, este trabajo con las redes. Se trata de una apuesta, ¿no? un proyecto institucional y político muy concreto, que es una especificidad de este museo en los últimos diez años, del Museo Reina Sofía. Tiene que ver con el trabajo relacional y el, con el trabajo afectivo. Tiene que ver con plantearnos lo que es la colaboración, qué es, qué implica y cómo se construye. Eh, desde Museo en Red, digamos que no, no, el objetivo no es producir productos, ¿no? que también hacemos proyectos, actividades públicas, publicaciones, activaciones de distinto tipo, pero tiene más que ver con la producción de dispositivos. Producir dispositivos de colaboración que vayan más allá de las lógicas de la coprogramación puntual o del puntualmente destinar unos recursos de la institución a otro lugar, tiene que ver con crear un marco común de gestión y corresponsabilidad. Tiene que ver con la puesta en valor de las diferencias entre las organizaciones que participan y en sus distintos modos de construir institucionalidad. Tiene que ver también con poner atención a los procesos en cada punto, en cada momento, estar con las otras en lo que las otras también producen y hacen. Tiene que ver con un momento, con revisar esos procesos juntas, ¿no? Dar, dar un tiempo a lo largo de, de cada una de esas activaciones en el pensarlo juntas en el antes, en el hacer, pero también en el después, ¿no? ¿Qué, qué se ha producido allí? ¿Qué, ¿Qué saber extraemos? ¿Cómo reflexionamos de ese, de ese colaborar? Tiene que ver con poner en valor lo que cada una aporta desde su saber específico. Y bueno, se trata de no solo eh, poner el foco en lo que hacemos, sino ponerlo en cómo lo hacemos y con quién lo hacemos. Y sobre todo, qué transformaciones potenciales puede producir esto al interno de la institución. Es un trabajo sostenido en el tiempo, en los años, que prevé un, formas de diálogo constantes y sobre todo también una escucha atenta que es algo que muchas veces las temporalidades de la institución no nos permiten hacer. Y bueno, tiene que ver con el cuidado, como decía, de las formas el, y también con el cuidado de las otras y con el autocuidado a la hora de producir ese dispositivo. Trasladar eso, hacer que eso permee al interno las metodologías de, de otras construcciones institucionales, sus modos de hacer sus modos de estar en ese hacer y de habitar, 
pero también eh, hay que ser realistas y es importante sobre todo asumir la institución, asumir desde dónde estamos hablando, cuáles son sus condiciones, sus lógicas y sus límites, sus jerarquías internas, porque por supuesto las hay, sus temporalidades, que la mayoría de las veces son muy rígidas, y tiene que ver con situarte en, desde un asumir la contradicción, porque trabajas en un espacio, eh, un museo de arte contemporáneo como el Reina Sofía, pues es un eje, de, es un agente de gentrificación, por ejemplo, del barrio de Lavapiés, es un agente de precarización laboral por sus modos de, de gestión también de lo laboral y de reconocimiento, es un espacio que está marcado por una división sexual y racial del trabajo, es una institución heredera de la modernidad que tiene muchas lógicas que no se, que no se cambian de un día para otro, lógicamente. Pero, de alguna manera, el trabajo sería imaginar esos marcos posibles y encontrar modos de traducción de esas lógicas institucionales a otras, ¿no? A, a, a otros modos de traducción que nos permitan generar escenarios posibles para hacer realidad cada uno de estos proyectos y para hacer realidad esa transformación interna. Porque nos enfrentamos ante un dispositivo técnico administrativo muy complejo y muy tendente al inmovilismo. Y eso también nos atraviesa personalmente y la dificultad eh, se halla también en encontrar un equilibrio entre nuestro deseo y la posibilidad de hacer. Pero sobre todo también tiene que ver con pasar a la acción. Y ahora voy a hablar de estos dos casos específicos como ejemplo ¿no? de, del tipo de trabajo que hacemos. El primero sería nuestra relación con la Fundación de los Comunes, que como os decía es este laboratorio que produce pensamiento crítico, que tiene que ver con los movimientos sociales, tiene que ver con la construcción de ciudadanía, tiene que ver con generar herramientas de intervención política. Con ellas hacemos eh, muchos, bueno, hemos activado dispositivos de muchos tipos, ¿no? desde seminarios, espacios también como internacionales, de convocar internacionalmente a reflexión, sobre todo siempre vinculado en el ámbito activista, a que también intentamos generar marcos de hibridación ¿no? de lo que el museo como institución dedicada a lo artístico puede también hibridar a las otras y que sea, digamos, en, en dos direcciones. Aquí bueno, podéis ver algunos de los, de los dispositivos que hemos generado con ellos y de la Fundación de los Comunes forma parte la Casa Invisible de Málaga, que es un centro social ocupado, ocupado por artistas hace más de 10 años, ahora han cumplido de hecho 12 años y que en el contexto de la ciudad de Málaga, que es una ciudad muy marcada por la construcción de un modelo de ciudad de museos, de instituciones dedicadas a la cultura que ponen de alguna manera el foco sobre todo en el turismo y que están, digamos, eh, que se ponen como un milagro económico por una parte, ¿no? pero que tienen que ver también con esos procesos de gentrificación, con los museos marca, Málaga, el Museo Picasso ha tenido pues, mucha relevancia, después llegó el Museo Pompidou, el Museo Thyssen y hay como una sobrecarga ¿no? de instituciones culturales. Frente a ese modelo, la Casa Invisible, que es un modelo autogestionado, muy centrado desde sus inicios en la cultura libre, está proponiendo otro modelo de, de institucionalidad que para nosotras resulta ¿no? muy, muy necesario y he aprovechado para meter aquí una imagen del crowdfunding que la Invisible ha iniciado hace pocos días para restaurar el edificio en el que se alberga, que está en el centro histórico de la ciudad de Málaga, es un edificio con un valor arquitectónico increíble y bellísimo y que las arquitectas de La Invisible van a, a restaurar y que no es sino una muestra ¿no? de, la, de la construcción de ciudadanía y de la revitalización del tejido eh, ciudadano que, que nace a partir de una iniciativa del común. Con La Invisible hemos colaborado mucho y un ejemplo que pondría sería... Eh, bueno, en 2017, este seminario, en 2017 el Museo Reina Sofía organizó la exposición Piedad y Terror, el camino hacia Guernica, una gran exposición sobre, sobre todo el trabajo, que todo el, digamos, la evolución que, llega, que lleva hasta la creación de Guernica, ¿no? esa gran obra y Picasso, y en aquel momento decidimos 
que íbamos a hacer una, un seminario sobre la figura de Picasso, pero en lugar de hacerlo en el museo, lo haríamos en Málaga y en lugar de hacerlo en el Museo Picasso, lo haríamos con las compañeras de la Casa Invisible, ¿no? por todo lo que la figura de Picasso ha supuesto de motor, de como el artista Rogelio López Cuenca, que, al que veis aquí participando en este seminario que organizamos, de motor de picasización de la ciudad de Málaga ¿no? y, de, y de construcción de este modelo cultural que es muy extractivo y poco productivo para, la, para, la, para el territorio social y afectivo de Málaga y para la ciudad de Málaga. Eh, esto que, bueno, la, que supone, la Casa Invisible ha estado en amenaza, en amenaza de desalojo en múltiples ocasiones, en dos o tres ocasiones hasta ahora, y han sido momentos en los que esta alianza museo-centro social eh, se vivifica ¿no? en, un, en una serie como de gestos de apoyo que tienen que ver con bueno, el reconocimiento mutuo, que tienen que ver con el lugar, reconocer el lugar que cada una ocupa en el ecosistema cultural y desjerarquizar ese lugar de poder y de visibilidad. Entonces, eh, el, el Manolo Borja, el director del Museo de Reina Sofía, ha, puntualmente pues, ha ido, hemos preparado, y así, esto es lo que os quería mostrar, ante esta situación de ataque ¿no? de, la, de un poder público que tiene muchas dificultades para reconocer el hacer de otros, por no decir que directamente lo ataca ¿no? de este modelo institucional, pues allí convocamos con las compañeras de La Invisible una mesa redonda sobre cuál es el papel de las instituciones culturales, en la que participó Manolo Borja, el director del Reina Sofía, participó Ferran Barenbli, el director del MACBA, también con una serie de actores muy claves en la cultura en la ciudad de Málaga, posicionándose en favor de la, de la defensa de la Casa Invisible, por lo que significa para la ciudad y por lo que significa para pensar los modos de producción cultural. Y esto nos lleva también ¿no? a hablar de otras colaboraciones con la Fundación de los Comunes en el marco de la actividad de la Ingobernable, que ha sido un centro social de comunes urbanos activo durante, que durante tres años se ha convertido en un espacio fundamental para los movimientos sociales en la ciudad de Madrid, pero también para la producción cultural. Y bueno, por, por poner algunos ejemplos, ¿no? eh, cuando han venido a participar en una actividad al museo, pues yo que es, por ejemplo, Tony Negri o Sueli Rolnik, también Paul Mason, han venido al museo y a su vez han ido a, eh, también a hacer una actividad en la ingobernable, ¿no? como esta especie de alianza de, de, de coproducción y de coprogramación, pero con la significación que, que eso tiene. ¿no? Y en el momento en el que la ingobernable empezó también a ser amenazada por las instituciones públicas, de, municipales y regionales en la ciudad de Madrid, generamos este debate eh, del Museo Ambaz a la Ingobernable, puede un centro social ser una institución cultural, de nuevo, en el que participaron Ma, eh, Manolo Borja, también Santi Eraso, que era, fue el director de Artelecu, una institución clave en el País Vasco, Rogelio López Cuenca y otra serie de personas en este intento ¿no? por, por eh, apoyar otro modelo posible, ap apoyar eh, otro modelo posible de institución. Entonces se trata, por una parte, más allá de coprogramar, como os he dicho, también de tender un espacio común, de, eh, de tender estas como alianzas estratégicas en un momento determinado y de defender este ecosistema cultural y ponerlo en valor una, en una apuesta política por un modelo cultural que sea más plural, más diverso y entramado, en el que, como decía, cada una ocupa un lugar fundamental y hay en una suerte de relación interdependiente, como diría la antropóloga Yayo Herrero. A ver cómo voy de tiempo. Vale. Y el segundo caso es la laboratoria, es esta red que propone espacios de investigación desde el activismo feminista. Es una red que nace casi en un acompañamiento de, desde el museo, lo cual nos... nos nos ha hecho siempre especial ¿no? emoción e inspiración eh, porque, eh, bueno, aquí podéis ver, en el año 2019 propusimos, con, en el marco de la colaboración con la Fundación, pero también con, unas, con algunas investigadoras feministas como Marta Malo 
que fueron las que auspiciaron este proyecto, eh, en el museo eh, tuvimos una mesa redonda titulada Articulando resistencias feministas justo antes del 8 de marzo del 2019 y que hablaba sobre la, internalización, la internacionalización y la potencia de la internacionalización del movimiento feminista en el que vinieron activistas de Marruecos, de Italia, de Brasil o de Argentina. Lo que hicimos fue crear una, un dispositivo de gira, aprovechando que venían las compañeras de Argentina, de gira por distintos espacios del territorio español, eh, que partía de intervenciones en el Reina Sofía y en la Ingobernable, pero que iba a atravesar la geografía, atravesando también a su vez los conflictos políticos que en ese momento el, el feminismo y la Comisión 8M en concreto atravesaba, lo cual enriqueció la gira de manera... ¿no? muy notable, y eh, que nos, nos ayuda a pensar un museo que no se despliega únicamente en sus límites, sino que se activa en otros lugares, en otros espacios, en otros territorios. Una gira bastante compleja en la que estuvimos en Barcelona, en Mala, aquí podéis ver imágenes de eh, una de las charlas en un espacio antirracista de Barcelona, en un momento en el que el antirracismo en el feminismo estaba ¿no? generando mucho debate y mucha toma de, de posición, en un spa, otra reunión en un espacio autogestionado de la ciudad de Málaga, feminista, que es la Medusa, y bueno, esta imagen de abajo la pongo, ¿no?, de cómo todo este dispositivo también crea un, un espacio de confianza, un entramado afectivo, que después se continúa desplegando. Entonces, ¿por qué traía esto? Eh, bueno, de un, ¿por qué...? Que, que, cómo el museo se transforma a partir de estas experiencias que tienen que ver con el feminismo ¿no? y cómo nosotras intentamos, atravesadas por esas experiencias, eh, de alguna manera trabajar así desde el museo. Entonces, estas son las preguntas que nos hacemos, ¿no? ¿qué significaría un museo feminista? ¿Es eso acaso posible? ¿Es eso medible, valorable o cuantificable según las, los, las maneras de medir de una institución y de una institución pública? ¿Y cómo afecta eso, como decía, a las metodologías, a los modos de reconocimiento, a la distribución del poder o a sus modos de visibilización? Para mí, y ya voy a ir cerrando con esto, todo este hacer... Eh, es lo que de alguna manera hizo posible que tuviera lugar una de las experiencias más radicales que yo he vivido en mis años trabajando en el museo, que es este Biotranslab, taller de ginecologías, perdón que me tapa la... Transhack feministas, en el que las artistas Paula Pin y Laura Benítez, que venían trabajando en otro tipo de espacios muy distintos, como comunas o casas ocupas o en una serie de laboratorios en los que el saber de las mujeres, de alguna manera extraído por la ciencia médica, se volvía, era, es reapropiado a partir de laboratorios do it yourself y de compartir conocimiento, conocimiento sobre tecnología, conocimiento sobre ciencia, muy inspiradas por un lado por los, el pensamiento de Lynn Margulis y de Dora Har Donna Haraway, y generar laboratorios de aprendizaje y de retomar ese conocimiento expropiado. Se trató, de un o sea, se trató de una experiencia que convirtió un espacio del museo de alguna manera en un laboratorio, en un espacio de hacer, durante cuatro días seguidos, eh, que estuvimos en este espacio, que es como una especie de sótano en el Museo Reina Sofía, donde estuvimos conviviendo... Perdón, a ver, y generando estos dispositivos do it yourself que son laboratorio son perdón microscopios creados con cámaras eh, con cámaras de las de webcams que son utilizados a su vez en una especie de um, aprendizaje colectivo para eh, para um, analizar muestras de nuestros cuerpos que no que nos auto tomábamos no y era toda la experiencia de, eh, bueno, se generó este espacio durante cuatro días en el que necesitas sostener un grupo que coma junto, que esté junto, que habite un espacio como el museo, un cubo blanco, frío, eh, totalmente, que no podrías imaginar, ¿no?, para que este tipo de experiencias tuvieran lugar, compartiendo buenos saberes desde de productos, eh, pues, y incluso llegando al momento en el que los cuerpos ¿no? se ponen en colectivo y se genera este espacio de confianza para poder eh, mostrarnos ¿no? tal y como somos y generar este laboratorio de experimentación. Algo que para mí, unos años atrás, no podría haber sucedido en, 
en el museo. Y aquí veis eh, cómo, bueno, después de sostener este pequeño laboratorio de 10 personas durante cuatro días, después se puso en común en una charla pública en la que todo este proceso era también de alguna manera devuelto a lo colectivo y a la luz y hecho público. Entonces terminaría quizá con, con alguna reflexión, ¿no? no quiero sonar naif, todo esto siempre son eh, de alguna manera experimentos, ensayos, en los que, tentativas en las que muchas veces fracasamos una y otra vez y en las que esa rigidez de la institución muchas veces se, eh, se, de alguna manera es, es, eh, bueno, son los límites eh, reales con los que nos encontramos pero sí alguna reflexión de qué es necesario ¿no? o de lo que yo considero que es necesario para que este tipo de tentativas institucionales tengan lugar. Para mí tiene también mucho que ver con trabajar en el interno, con el equipo, con la gente que hace posible la institución, con todos esos saberes distintos ¿no? y trascender la lógica del, del curador o del programador sino que cada persona tiene un lugar que es igual de relevante en cada uno de los proyectos. Entonces, tiene que ver con generar un espacio de respeto y de puesta en valor del trabajo de cada quien, como decía, con, donde los afectos nos sostienen cada día. Tiene que ver con las condiciones materiales que son fundamentales y necesarias y que generalmente, bueno, muchas veces son un, suponen un compromiso difícil de mantener ¿no? desde la institución. No siempre se dan, no siempre se cumplen. Eh, voy a pasar a la última diapositiva que ahora hablo de ella. Entonces, para eso, o sea, para que se genere una reflexión interna institucional y de la gente que está haciendo institución, hay que hacer espacio, hay que hacer espacio para ello. Y hacer espacio supone dejar tiempo y dejar eh, tiempo para el descanso, tiempo para el pensamiento y tiempo para la conversación. Y eso no siempre es difícil de tener en la institución. Y sostener, ¿no? Sostener, hacer que esto sea continuado y que la institución se comprometa. Es algo que, por ejemplo, al día de hoy que sigue, las instituciones siguen siendo jerárquicas, si no es por el compromiso absoluto de la dirección, eh, bueno, en este caso de, de Manolo Borja y de Mabel Tapia, con este tipo de institucionalidad, eso a día de hoy no es posible. Aquí he puesto esta imagen que, bueno, es un poco ese espacio que hacemos, es una residencia de investigación a la que fuimos juntas, compañeras que trabajamos en el museo, a eh, bueno, hacer una residencia de un grupo de lecturas que tenemos y que sostenemos en el tiempo, que se llama Respirar, y que se creó en la pandemia y que tiene que ver con ese respirar juntas durante, durante nuestro trabajo y encontrar el tiempo para hacerlo. Y por último diría que los, bueno, los límites, ¿no? como decía, que son muchos y, y son complejos. Los marcos jurídicos, que son los que son y que obviamente trabajamos con ellos también, pero que muchas veces son muy inflexibles. Las temporalidades aceleradas de la institución, la precariedad, como decía. Y bueno, dejaría así eh, mi intervención con la pregunta de ¿Cómo hacemos que las prácticas transformadoras permeen de tal modo que trasciendan a la marcha de las personas? Porque cierro con lo que empecé, ¿no? las instituciones están eh, producidas también por personas, lo cual es una potencia enorme, pero también es una fragilidad enorme, porque muchas veces cuando esas personas no están es difícil sostener el proyecto. Y con esto termino. Muchas gracias a todas. Muchas gracias, Sara, que has terminado justo con lo que yo estaba pensando, que cómo, cómo, hacer, cómo hacer continuidad cuando hay también todos estos, todos estos cambios. Entonces, ahora, um, bueno, vamos ouvir ahora entonces la presentación de Marco Baravalli y abrimos para a conversa colectiva no final. Muito obrigada, Marco. Yes, so thank you very much, Anna and the Teatro do Barrio Alto for the invitation. Thank you very much to the technical team and also to Luis for uh, uh, moderating this, this uh, session. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to speak about uh, a very different experience compared to the Museum Reina Sofia, uh, but an experience that has some uh, things in common. So. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about Saledox, uh, which is a small uh, collective and also an activist art space in Venice. 
And um, it was a space that we occupied in 2007. So it was founded through the occupation of a former and empty salt warehouse in the heart of the historical city of Venice. It is now managed by a collective of more or less like 10 people. The core is made by uh, 10 people, but with a lot of lots of people around us that help us that collaborate with us on specific on specific uh, projects. So, but in order to give you like a bit of the atmosphere that we breathe as Saladox, I would like to begin with a two minutes video. It is a video about the last activity that we had at Saled, the last 6th of March, you know, we are, of course, here in Italy too, in between openings and, 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 and closings due to COVID. So we were fortunately able to have a workshop, a training uh, on the last 6th of March that was in the context of a wider project called Training for the, training for the Future, curated by Florian Malzacher and, and Jonas Stahl. And the reason why I, I would like to begin with this video is not only because uh, it gives you a bit of the atmosphere of, of Sale Docs, but also because uh, it was about the, the, the necessity to think about, to imagine or to also practice like a commoning of our institution. So I'm going to share my screen. And then, yeah. So, uh, after we, yeah, here I am. Uh, after we occupied the space in 2007, we were basically immediately evicted one month later uh, by the city police, but we got back inside again. Uh, basically, we spent the five years as an occupied space, so illegally. Then we were finally able, after five years of work in the in the space of Sade Docs, the one that you that you saw in the in the video, we were able to get a uh, an agreement with the city council, and that th this agreement lasted nine years. We were able to be legally recognized. We were paying a sort of let's call it rent, even if it's not rent to to 
to the city. Uh, this agreement expired one year uh, ago. So now we are in a sort of uh, gray zone. We don't really know what is what is going to be our immediate future, uh, especially because now uh, the city administrations of Venice is an administration that is uh, very like neoliberal right wing. So it's not really uh, looking with interest as, as such, at such, let's say, uh, cultural experimentations. So I'm gonna uh, share again my screen and I would like to show you a few slides. Here we go. So uh, the, the, uh, the reason why we decided to occupy Saladox was because we wanted to, we, when I say we, we, we were, and we still are uh, social activists living in Venice, precarious art and culture workers, and, and, and a network of researchers. And we wanted to experiment a non-neoliberal art institution. But what does it mean, a non-neoliberal art institution in a city like Venice that is basically a, 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 a very famous art and tourist city? Uh, I basically highlighted five points that I would like to share with you to try to clarify uh, what is the work that we're trying to do at Sala Docs. So this is, uh, by the way, the, the, the space seen from the, from the outside. You see, uh, you see here there is the the, the door of Sala Docs with the with the banner. These are the Magazzini del Sale. The, the, these are former salt ancient form former salt warehouses of the Serenissima Republic. So, what does it mean to experiment a non neoliberal art institution in Venice? First of all, it means an attempt at breaking the link between art and rent, and specifically art and real estate rent. What do I mean? Let's try to uh, explain it concretely. What you are seeing here is a map of uh, some, uh, of the collateral events of some art biennials of, or biennial of a few years ago. And everybody who has come at least once to Venice to visit the biennial knows that you have this two red areas, which are the Giardini and the Arsenale, so the main venues of the Biennials, and then you have uh, dozens and dozens of uh, exhibitions in the city, and these are only the official collateral events of the Biennale, but you have many more that are not officially mapped here on this, on this map of the Biennale. So, and you, I think you, you can imagine that most of these spaces are privately owned spaces. And so basically there, there, there is a, a, a huge amount of money that arrives in the city. And thanks to the business of renting uh, spaces for the exhibition, this money go into, goes into, into immediately into private pocket. And also another thing that happens and that happens almost everywhere is that this this uh, uh within these spaces within these exhibitions uh work very young workers that most of the time are highly prep uh, precarized precarious workers or uh unpaid interns etc etc so uh this is in venice it's really clear not only our real estate rent parasites the art industry, but also how the art industry designs and think of itself as a boost for real estate rent. So uh, I think it's pretty self-evident that by occupying and self-managing a space, we basically subtracted from the market of empty spaces to rent. So we basically refuse the idea that art means to empty of projects the space. This is because this is exactly what happens in Venice, because lots of spaces are spaces that are so-called exhibition spaces, art spaces, but they only work for a period, uh, uh, for, for, for a, uh, half of the year during the Biennale, and they are totally emptied of any kind of project uh, always. So uh, basically, we are living in a city where very often art is a synonym of, of rent. And there, there is a very good, very good uh, business for, 
for owners, very good business for also for uh, big agencies that work in the mediation between those who want to rent spaces and those who are, and, and the owners. And often what, what uh, the, this, this agency, these renting agencies present themselves as, uh, as cultural foundations, but they, are, they really have nothing to do with any kind of uh, cultural project, let's say. So this is the first thing that we try to do. We try to problematize, to highlight, and to give a practical, uh, a practical alternative to this link between art and real estate rent that in Venice is very, very visible. So also uh, the, 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 the different constituency that Sale Docs has uh, in, in comparison with that of a, let's say of a neoliberal museum. Now I, here I, I prepared a slide where, I mean, the, 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 let's say uh, the contrast is, is very clear, but is in order to, uh, to be exactly, to be clear. So on the left side of the screen, you see, for example, an assembly of the committee against big cruise ships that happened in Sale a few years ago. And it was a national assembly where we hosted many, many environmental uh, uh, movements from all over Italy. And we prepared together a common mobilization that then brought more than 150,000 people to Rome to protest against uh, uh, major works uh, to protest against the uh, extractivist policies and for climate justice. And so, for example, the Committee Against Big Cruise Ships is a, an activist group that uses the space of Sale on a regular basis. And this is not something else from being a cultural institution. This is really part of, the, of our constituency. Another, for example, you see in the lower part of the screen, you see this, this um, sort of small uh, poster that is advertising a, a meeting with Porpora Marcacian, who is a very uh, important trans, Italian trans activist. And this was organized by the local chapter of Ni Una Menos. And Ni Una Menos, Non Una Di Meno Venice, the local chapter, is another activist group that uses the spaces, the space on a regular basis, not only when it comes to events, but always as assemblies, as a place for, for organization, I would say. On the right side, you see, for example, another type of constituency. It, it happened that in 2016, I was in New York at the very same time when the Brooklyn Museum was hosting the sixth annual Brooklyn Real Estate Summit. And there were, you know, lots of grassroots associations, lots of, lots of artists outside the museum protesting because of course, uh, whoever knows a bit New York City know how violent gentrification there is and how really this, this is a sort of war against the poor, a, a true and very violent war against the poor. And so in that case, the artists, local artists and local grassroots movement, anti-gentrification movements were protesting the fact that the Brooklyn Real Estate Summit happened within the facilities of a, of a public museum. So the second thing is the working on our constituency. Third point is the... Uh, idea that Sale Docs wants to defend in the city of Venice a type of art which is not that type of art that is so uh, strictly tied to global private financial capitals. So in the last 15 years, despite or maybe because a growing, uh, for example, of, of the Biennale as an event, you know, more pavilions, more countries, more visitors, uh, the, 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 the ecosystem that grew around it was a very peculiar ecosystem. In Venice now, the, we have really, really little uh, space for non-profit art spaces, activist art spaces, independent art spaces. But we have witnessing during the years a continued arrival and opening of private foundations that are linked to uh, private financial capitals. The Pinot Collection, that of course everyone knows who Francois Pinot is, is one of the biggest art collector and French tycoon of luxury industry. Uh, or the VAC, 
at Zattere. Um, the VAC is the foundation of Leonid Mikkelsen, who is a, who is a Russian oligarch, or the ocean space. It is a space that uh, basically reopened a, a, an ancient church, the Church of San Lorenzo in the neighborhood of Castello. And ocean space is linked to the Thyssen Bornemista family, so another historical family of collectors and 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 uh, and uh, and entrepreneurs and global entrepreneurs, I would say. So what we see here in Venice is that the physical space of the city and the physical spaces that are devoted to art are more and more linked to these global financial capitals. Those who can afford to organize or to show art in the city are these big, uh, these big uh, billionaires, global billionaires, I would say, that are attracted by the, the, the collective symbolic capital of, of the city of Venice, of course. So Saladox is an answer to this sort of, uh, to this sort of, would say, of reduction of biodiversity of, of art. And then, of course, it's a type of art which is very object-oriented, which is very... Uh, we, which is very also linked to the idea of private property, to the idea of the investment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, what we are trying to do is also to, um, I would say, to contrast the logic of the neoliberal event. Venice works as a neoliberal event city, as as a tourist and art city. The the economy, or at least the the pre-COVID life of the city really was, uh, I would say, punctuated by this non-stop uh, chain of events. So there is the cinema festival, the art biennial, the carnival, it's Christmas, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's a non-stop. We see here on the left uh, 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 the opening, the, the traditional opening, opening parade of the carnival in, in the close to the Canale of Canareggio. And of course, on the right side, we see the red carpet of the of the of the cinema festival, but uh, I think I think uh, the neoliberal event it is exactly the opposite uh, of the event when it's thought, for example, by radical philosophy. So, for example, if we read, I don't know, Tony Negri, but not only Tony Negri, he describes the event as a moment of a, of a rupture of temporality as a moment that shatters the continuum of history, as a moment in which new being appears. He refers to the event, linking the event to the kairos. The kairos, kairos is a Greek word, and is a, is a Greek word that refers to the decisive moment, uh, to a moment, again, of rupture, of discontinuity. Uh, and this is absolutely something linked to the idea of, of not only of revolution, but also of art. And indeed also Gadamer. Uh, Gadamer describes the word event as being the place of a non-methodical discovering of truth, of a truth which is not linked to scientific knowledge. And what Gadamer says, for example, is that it's exactly art, the place where this event appears, the encounter between, uh, uh, between someone and the work of art. But the neoliberal event is, is the exact opposite of this possibility of the appearance of new being. It is exactly the, the, the training of the event in a neoliberal event, be it a festival, be it a, a carnival or whatever, nothing really happens but the event itself as it is planned by the neoliberal governance, by cultural management. So we are trying, of course, with our small uh, forces to bring back rupture into the event and into the neoliberal city. We are also trying, and this is something that we discovered during our 13 years of life, we're also trying to uh, uh, opposed to the neoliberal nomadism of, of the art worker with something that we called radical permanence. 
Uh, you see on the left side of the screen uh, uh, some uh, diagram of the relationship between the different biennials, but I could have chosen hundreds of images. We all know that we move from, uh, or at least we moved in the pre-COVID era from, uh, from biennial to biennial, from art fair to art fair, from residency to residency, from university to university, from museum to museum, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes we, we also tell ourselves the story that we are a new global romantic nomads and that we are in a way uh, building a structure of relationship that resists, for example, uh, the injustices of the neoliberal global system. I think this is something that has to be questioned. I think that the way our neoliberal art mobility structure is something that goes to the all advantage of profit and to the expense of the commons. And also I think that while we move endlessly, now we move, we endlessly, endlessly move from Zoom to Zoom, while we endlessly move, when the global art circuit lands somewhere in some city with a museum, with a festival, with a biennial, they are shaping and changing the situation of the city. They are shaping and changing the quality of the public space. Usually a museum, usually, okay, the Reina Sofia is an exception or the network of the Internazionale is an exception. But usually uh, when a museum lands somewhere, it's gentrification, it's raising of, of real estate uh, prices, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the biennial in Venice is something really important to us. Of course, we acknowledge the importance of the, of the Venice biennial because we acknowledge the importance of being like a, of remaining a global cultural hub. But at the same time, the, the effect that th this type of event has on the city is an effect that is more comparable to that of a, of a big tourist event. It's not helping Venetians to come back to live in the city. It's not attracting new residents. It's attracting visitors, it's attracting tourists, and it's, uh, and it's basically contributing to uh, the fueling of real estate rent, which is, uh, I would say, the main problem of the tourist industry in Venice. So what is radical permanence? It, it, only as an example, I, I, uh, uh, put on the on the right side of the screen, I put a map of all the activist, let's say, demonstrations, actions, or things that happened in Venice in 2006 and 2007. Radical permanence means that while we move, while of course we do not deny the importance of having transnational uh, relationships and also of transnational organization. Uh, while we move, we also take care of the place we're in. We also try to build some, uh, some alter institutions that have different effects on the social fabric of, of, of the local. And that, and that also imagine mobility, art mobility in a different way on a global scale. So radical permanence is not that we stay still, that we don't move. But for example, is the idea that also ecological crisis says that maybe as our operators, we have to move less, but we have to be more, let's say, uh, we have to, to activate ourselves more in order to provide, for example, migrants with, with, uh, with uh, the right to move, because there are many, many people that uh, don't have the right to move in the, in, the, in the world as it's structured now, and not only now. So I would say that these are at least five fields of what I called alter institutionality. Of a, these are, uh, I would say, three, uh, five testing grounds for alter institutionality, and one and, and some that we practically encountered while uh, after we occupied Saladot. So let me now go to uh, to tell you a bit more in detail about some projects that we have been doing in Saladot in this period of thirteen years of activity. So for example, uh, we operate with almost uh, zero budget. So the group is not paid for, for the work that we do at Saladox. 
unless someone is employed, for example, if someone has to open the space for two months because there's an exhibition, then it has to spend, I don't know, like 30 years inside the space. Of course, there's a, we, we try to find a budget for it because it's so much time demanding. But, you know, usually it's, it's activist uh, work, let's say. So we had to find different models of sustainability. Of course, we, we don't rent the space. We do partnerships. We do partnerships. Okay, so uh, also with with um, with museums, with with inst with other institutes. But the point is that always or almost always the collective has to be engaged in the project of things that happen in the space, because we don't want to reproduce the empty box idea of art as rent. So, for example, how did we uh, build most part of Solidox concretely? In a in a in a partnership with a with what back then, like ten years ago, was a, a sort of association, and now it evolved in a in a in an actual um, in an actual company that now now is called R three B. Back then, it was called Rebiennale, and this group of people basically re uh, reused uh, wasted materials from the Biennale of Venice. So materials that, of course, they are quite new after six months of an ex exhibition, but they're usually thrown away. And to throw away these almost new materials is a very, very expensive thing. So they came with this idea to basically scout the different exhibition that had to be dismantled to basically collect for free, or let's say for a fair amount of money, uh, these materials and then put them back in circle within within a, a ecosystem of social spaces, independent spaces, public spaces, schools, parks, etc. So here you see ourselves basically in, in a workshop of self construction of the mezzanine of Saladox that we did thanks to the wood that was used by Thomas Kilper, who is a German artist and. Back then, in 2012, he was he, 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 he designed and built a huge wooden installation close to the to the Danish pavilion inside the Jardin of the Arsenale. We got friends with Thomas. Uh, thanks to the mediation of Rebiennale, he, he decided to donate its wood to us, but not only to them, to design the mezzanine, and we self-built together the mezzanine. And this is the final result. And and for example. It's not only the mezzanine. This is this is if you see, for example, the wooden structures, these stairs on which the people are sitting for this for this seminar. Uh, this was the former ceiling of the German pavilion of the Biennale of I don't remember precisely what year. In that case, the event was this it was this seminar called Upstrike. So the the the, the thing was how to what is strike in the in the era of financial abstraction? There was the already mentioned Tony Negri participating, Matteo Pasquinelli, and Florian Schneider. I see here speaking. Uh, Open Six. Uh, a few a few years ago, I discovered, for example, by reading by reading the the uh, the journal by Harald Zeman uh, of of his journey to to realize. Uh, the very famous exhibition when attitudes become form i read that, that, that it, when he was speaking before the exhibition uh with uh, uh i forgot the name of the artist um with piero girardi who is a very important italian artist uh, a very radical italian artist uh when when talking to piero girardi before the exhibition girardi suggested to zeman to forget the usual let's say uh, hierarchy between curator and artist and to organize the exhibition as a big assembly of course zeman chose another chose another path and um what we did was basically to uh, to follow in a way the 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 suggestion by piero girardi and in 2013-14 we organized uh, from scratch uh an exhibition of contemporary art through a participative method. So the thing that we did was basically to put out a very simple communication campaign uh, outside in the city and on social networks, uh, 
addressing the art operators or our university students living in the city and saying that the communication was really simple. Do you want to organize together a collective exhibition, come at Saladox at this place and time? And we were expecting like 30 people, but eventually 130 people showed up. And this was the beginning of an incredible uh, seven months long process in which this assembly uh, meeting once every two weeks took every decision, but then this assembly sort of uh, 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 gave birth to smaller groups that also like independently created a very, very interesting process. So in the end, we had an actual exhibition. Here you see some, some, uh, some uh, pictures of the, uh, of the exhibition itself. But not only the result was important, but also the process. So there was one group that was devoting to analyzing the conditions of gentrification in a few neighborhoods of Venice. So uh, interviewing uh, shop owners, residents, etc. There was another group that was more uh, interested to the ecology of the lagoon. So they organized boat trip, boat trips in the lagoon, and they organized a few seminars on, on the. Uh, environment of, of the lagoon, inviting scholars, etc. And, uh, et and there was another. There was another group that basically conducted a series of of um, uh, derives uh, uh, in, in in San Marco Square. So it was a very generative process. For example, and and also the, the exhibition also had an aftermath. For example, this this big wooden sculpture that you see on the lower um, left corner was a, a nine month long wooden crocodile made by Kaya, who's a local uh, artist and, and tattoo artist and writer and street artist. And the interesting thing was that, for example, a few months later, we moved the crocodile, that cro crocodile from the space to the garden of a public of a very important public school in Venice that was about to be privatized. So it, had, it also had an afterlife and, 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 and we connected to some, also the, the, the nice thing is that this particular piece connected itself to some struggles uh, for the right to the city in Venice. Uh, another, not project, but another action that we did, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, Gulf Labor. Gulf Labor was a campaign basically initiated by a group of US artists and scholars against the Guggenheim because the Guggenheim was and is still trying to build its branch in the, in the Sadiat Island in Abu Dhabi in the Arab Emirates. And the point is that these museums are built by mainly by Southern, uh, Southeastern Asian uh, migrant workers that are kept in, in horrible conditions, almost conditional slavery with, with, uh, with very low pay, pays and, and, and also they are blackmailed. So uh, Gulf Labor initiated this campaign to meet the workers' demands and this uh, action on pressure over the Guggenheim. On 2015, in 2015, Gulf Labor was invited as one official participant to the Biennale by Oquien Resort. That, that year was the curator of the, of the international art exhibitions. And so we, they made contact with us and we organized together a sort of uh, action of occupation of the terrace of the Guggenheim Foundation. This is the terrace on the Guggenheim Foundation on the, on the Grand Canal. So this is an action that we did with Gulf Labor. This is just to show that beyond uh, exhibitions, projects, seminars, trainings, workshops, we we also do direct actions. And we did the last one, only one, the, the last demonstration, we organized it like one month and a half ago. Another project was titled Dark Matter Games, uh, following the, the, uh, the concept created by US artists and, and and scholar Gregory Cholette. Gregory Cholette uses an astrophysical metaphor to describe how the artwork 
how the art world works. He basically says that the artwork, the contemporary artwork, is basically made by a very small visible percentage of percentage of uh, visible artists, curators, art operators, and this very small percentage is basically sustained, especially financially, by a huge core or bulk of what he calls dark matters. So that is indebted art students, amateur artists, are or let's say. Uh, the audiences that go to art events, those who buy art supplies, those who take art classes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But dark matter is also made by those uh, uh, individuals or collectives which uh, choose a certain amount of invisibility because they don't want to play according to the rules of the neoliberal art world. So what we did, one of the things that we did in, in this project, there was a bigger project, Dark Matter Games, that also involved many, for example, works in the public space. But what we did at Salem, together with Gregory Cholet himself and, uh, and the Polish curator Kuba Schreder, we organized this, this sort of, uh, I don't know if, if I could call it work, that we called the Dark Matter Super Collider. We self-built this, this uh, uh, exhibition design, as you can see here, this is inspired by the LNT system by Friedrich Kiesler, who was a revolutionary exhibition designer. And this is one exhibition design he, he created in the in the 20s, you know, these self-standing structures, etc. But anyway, so the, the, the let's say the, the aesthetic inspiration comes from the, the exhibition design of the historical avant-garde. And we basically put out an open call for for creative dark matter to send us examples of these dark matter creativities and we creativity. And we received dozens of posters, leaflets, props, small objects, publications that we, we uh, showed through this dark matter super, super collider. And uh, I would say last but not least, if I'm not wrong, uh, this is also because we work also with, with artists. This is a part of, a, again, of a wider, of a bigger project that was titled All, All Work and No Play. And these are pictures of the installation by Danilo Correale. Danilo Correale is an Italian artist based in New York City. And Danilo basically uh, made a video and a script that is an actual hypnotherapy uh, relaxation session. And the script tells you a story of a post-work society, a society where basically automation is going the opposite way as it going in reality, but where a society where automation basically uh, uh, has been freeing uh, the humankind from the necessity to work. So, and, and, and also, I mean, this, this, uh, this installation was accompanied by uh, three days seminars in which we discussed uh, matters such as, you know, contemporary labor and the artwork, contemporary labor and gender, etc., etc. So uh, this is another picture of another contribution to all work and no play. This is the Institute of Human Obsolescence and the idea of creating this data workers union, but it was, this would be too long to explain. Uh, other other uh, projects that we did at Solidox that I'm not uh, that I'm not uh, describing now. This is a the the I think I think the the only solo show by the very co controversial Russian collective Vaina. As far as I know, we had it in 2013. And uh, let me finish with something that I think also fits very well the context uh, today. Let me finish with what is called now a fictional institution. So an institution that does not exist, but that tells us very important things about uh, actual institutions. So uh, I don't know if uh, I, I had the chance because I was in France, like uh, in 2019, by chance, I had the chance to uh, to see this movie titled Bacurau. It's a Brazilian movie by uh, the director's name is Kleber Mendoza Fio. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it uh, uh, in the wrong way. And basically, that's the story of a small rural, rural village in central Brazil that is called Bacurau. 
And what happens in Bacurau is that Bacurau is, target, is targeted is a sort of neo-Western pulp movie. Bacurau is targeted by a group of uh, Yankees and European crazy people that paid a company in order to hunt the locals. So it is a sort of metaphor of colonialism. And the, the, let's say the war between the locals and this group of crazy human hunters or, or, or killers develops to a point. And, and then the, the final, there's a bit of a spoiler, I know, sorry, but I, I think the, the, the movie is worthy anyway. The final place, the place of the final challenge between the, the foreigners, the, the colonizers, the violent colonizer, and the, and the locals. By the way, the chief of the local community is a, is a sort of shaman woman, is a, is a, is a witch, and, and, and the, uh, the place is populated by a gang of queer outlaws. So you have, really have all the, of all the elements of, de of the decolonizing discourse. And the, the, the museum becomes the, the final place of the final challenge between the locals and the colonizer, and when the colonizers get eventually defeated. And this is really, uh, really incredible, because this is exactly what, uh, what uh, community museums in, in, in Latin America, maybe even more in Central America, maybe even more in Mexico, but I'm sure in Brazil too, uh, signified historically. There is a, a very interesting article by uh, Yeis Hernandez Velasquez uh, that is titled Curating After 1972. And it tells the story about how the ICOM, the International Co Council of Museums in 1972, so one year before the coup d'etat in Chile, uh, hosted its international round table exactly in Santiago de Chile. And, and this round table was very important for the for let's say for the proposition of a non-eurocentric idea of museum and museology and this non-eurocentric idea that uh, was based on the idea that museums should not reproduce a western uh, structure or western epistemologies but should be dispositives to help the saboteurs of south america and i'm almost uh, literally quoting the the result of this round table. And then the community museums really became one of the, one of the sites of this uh, epistemological resistance. And, and, and the director here, Kleber Mendoza Fio, is uh, sort of reconstructing the history in a, in a, in a sort of uh, pulp and cinematic way. So uh, with the community museum of Bacurau, I think I'm, gone, I'm, I'm, I'm done. And thank you very much for your attention. Mm, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I'm just jumping in to say that we, we accept questions here on chat and also on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you so much. And I will give um, uh, Luis voice or Luis Forza. Obrigado, Ana. Eu gostava só de agradecer ao Teatro do Bairro Alto a oportunidade de moderar esta conversa que muito me interessa pela minha própria prática e, e, e pelo trabalho e pela reflexão que eu tenho vindo a desenvolver uh, em torno do pensamento de instituições uh, e, e, e da crítica da instituição cultural. Um, I'm going to switch to English because uh, I think it's, it's an easier way of, of speaking to both our guests and I think it is... It is uh, I think it's a really interesting uh, conversation that we're having here today, um, especially for for very local reasons. Since I, I I I guess Portuguese contemporary art institutions have historic have been historically completely detached from from this institutional debate, this kind of self reflexive uh, research into their own uh, processes and into their own mechanisms and what do they do when they do what they do, basically. Um, what sorts of institutional protocols do they reproduce and what are the consequences of that? 
what others do they choose to change uh, in order to achieve something else. Um, so that has been completely absent from, from the institutional discourse locally. Um, and even though it may have seemed that for a while uh, the discussion was going to start, there has been in the past few years a, a very strange conservative turn in Portuguese cultural institutions, in, Port in, in, in Portuguese um, visual art institutions, and, and that debate seems as difficult now as it has never been. So it, it's great that Teatro do Bairro Alto was able to, to, to set up this, this incredible um, discussion. Um, I think, I think both Sara and Marco touched on, on very important topics uh, and, and I really appreciate the, the difference in scale and the difference in scope, uh, which despite you know, the very different structures of those two institutions, we can, we can really encounter an alignment, uh, an ethical alignment, a political alignment, a language alignment, that allows us uh, to speak critically through and about institutions, and um, I, I was very, I was, I was very curious and and, and very interested in Sara, and I'm going to start with you, Sara, um, because Reina Sofia is 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 you know such an important museum, um, European wise and and on a global scale, of course. Um, and, and of course, trying to do such a reflection or trying to think about uh, these issues from the, point, from, from the point of such a big institution must be really complicated because institutions are by default monsters. Uh, and, and it's really interesting. And the, the contradictions that you've pointed out throughout your presentation are, are very important and you've, you've acknowledged all of them. And I think that's really interesting. Uh, and it, it, it's interesting that the museum is aware of them, of course. But what I would like, what, what I would like to ask you is, is there, um, is there a way further? Is there, uh, is, how, do, how does the museum go beyond acknowledging those contradictions? Um, is there a charter for implementing change? Is there policies that define, for instance, in five years time, we'll achieve this and we'll achieve that. How does the research and the knowledge produced by Museo en Red uh, feed into the institution as a whole? Um, Thank you, Luis, for this pertinent question, which is really difficult to <laughs> answer indeed. Oh, let me switch um, the view, because otherwise I only see myself and it's uh, <laughs> um, well, um, in the first place, in the first place, I want to underline that I'm not speaking like uh, from the institution, I'm speaking from uh, personal experience and collective reflection. Um, and also, as you can imagine, this big monster, this big museum has very different levels that also reflects on uh, institutionality. I'm talking about one specific uh, dispositive of the museum that for sure, uh, and that is also part of the whole department of public activities. Then I can mention that this uh, from some years uh, to now, it's been working with different, different threads or working lines that kind of articulate our work, even if we are uh, working producing cinema dispositives or seminars that are what we call uh, Lineas Idea Fuerza, mm -hmm. and that maybe some of them are like um, Commons is one of them, Avant Garde is another, Politics and Aesthetics of the Memory is another. Uh, action and radical imagination is another one in which Museo en Red is working a lot that has to do with uh, activism and, and that has to do with other kind of ways of producing institutionality. Um, but it's really, in a way, 
as I said in the beginning, this is something that the institution started like 10 years ago, that at that moment, Museo Red was kind of a way of pointing out some of the activities or some of the way we were starting to work, but it, it was not as programmatic or it was not like a cell inside the institution as it is now. And I would say that it takes time also no, for creating this, that what, what we call uh, practical theories, no? that there is a knowledge and there is, um, yeah, there is a knowledge that came from the practice and what you can, uh, after that practice, reflect on that. And this is something, this kind of reflection uh, or self-reflection, as you mentioned, is, is, is not a, a so institutionalized practice in the institution. No, it's quite uh, uncommon indeed. I have friends working in an institution, and this is something that it's always no in like a una falta, no something that is been missing for so long. And yeah, I would say that the policies is uh, we have been creating the policies, and now after these ten years, in a certain way, we are in a moment in which we have this more complex reflection because of the experiences we have been going through. And we are in a moment also to, that we believe is uh, important also to make visible more of, uh, many of these processes that have been invisible for, men, for so long and that has to do not only with productive work, but also with reproductive work, no? as uh, Federici would say, that creates inside the institution a kind of, of um, a sensitive structure that can operate in a different way. But it's also about fragility and vulnerability because it's a structure that is that you really need to take care about all the, the conditions and that can des be distracted so easily, you know, in terms of the relationship with the others, in terms of the team that is running the things, in, term in terms of if the political project can of the institution and the institutional project, I would say better, can remain no, along the years because it, ta it takes years. To, it's a long-term thing. It's nothing that you can create uh, so easily. And we are trying to, to put time no, in, in writing as well now, in going into spaces of sharing like this in order to visibilize this. No? And also we are yeah, preparing a publication that will um, uh, come in some months about this, because of course it's important this kind of institutional experimentation remains in a way, no? and it's open and can be read, reinterpret and take over by others in other, in other places, in other geographies, in other political conditions. Um, yeah, it's. I would say that no, the, the long term thing, and it's not mm -hmm. you can put the, the a sticker on you, and it's easy, <laughs> not at all. And I don't know if I uh, answer your question. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting that you that you mentioned, and it, that's something that I also struggle with, of course, that all the work that is being done most of the time is invisible because it's not it's not public in the sense that it is not program it's not public activity it's 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 behind the curtains it's it's the work that needs to take place so that the institution starts operating in a different way um, and making that process visible or making that process public uh, is also uh, an important part of this self-reflexivity. And uh, you were mentioning making a publication that kind of uh, makes that visible and available for everyone because most of the time, this remains within the walls of the institution. So Marco, I would, I would like to bring you in and, and ask you, how does this work within your case, because a lot of what you do uh, and, and a lot of your institutional reflection is made public. Uh, but how do you go about these kind of internal processes of reflection uh, that eventually lead to uh, change, institutional change or societal change? Well, it's it's learning by doing. In our mm. case, it's learning by doing. Uh, to be to be extremely honest, we 
we di I didn't tell the whole story because of, of, of the lack of time. I didn't want to be too long. But I said Salad Dogs uh, was founded because we wanted to experiment uh, an alternative or non-liberal alter institution. It's not the truth. I mean, the truth was much more militant. I mean, when, when, we, when we occupied the space of Salad Dogs in 2007, uh, we were seeing around ourselves uh, the opening of New Art Foundation. We were seeing, witnessing the growing, an exponential growing of the Biennale. We were seeing new art faculties opening the city, et cetera, et cetera. And we thought, since we have a, a, an operaist background, a workerist background, we were thinking of the city as a factory. And, and, and we were speaking, writing, and, and writing theory and, and, and about, you know, like Venice as a culture factory. And the idea was that our sort of small avant-garde organization would have led this new composition of art workers and culture workers to the revolution. It was a total failure. Okay, <laughs> so I, we we also have to admit our our failures. Our and, and it was a total failure uh, because we were sort of uh, translating in a in a too literal way the theories uh, of of the of the operaist movement in the sixties that were related to to the to the uh, factory workers so it's it's another anthropological cultural social word but but so we 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 started to interrogate ourselves what are we doing what is our use what is the use what uh, is it still meaningful to do something like this or shall we just you know everyone take care of his or her own you know individual career at least when we work we work paid or it's not it's not uh, assured, but you know, and and what we were discovering, we, we, it was exactly this idea of working on on institutional structure, which means to reflect on uh, a different uh, understanding, ontological, uh, different ontological understanding of what art is in comparison with with other neoliberal institutions, in comparison with the museums that is next door to us in comparison to the uh, big billionaires that a big billionaire that open his uh, space to host his own collection, his own private collection. So it, it is. It was a process, and this and we are updating this process. So we also learn to reflect as an institution. Mm -hmm. Also very important. Also very important. It was we we, we occupied it in two thousand and seven. So. I like to think of ourselves more or less as pioneers in this uh, wave of cultural occupation. But that after what was really important and also was really important to us to open our eyes was in 2011, the occupation by uh, theater and art workers of the Teatro Valle in Rome, a uh, big public theater in Rome that uh, was in danger of being privatized, was empty, was not working. And they occupied it and was and it was a national thing, you know. And on the wave of the occupation of Teatro Valle, like other 10 cultural spaces all around Italy, from north to south, were occupied by, by cultural workers. And what they did, what they were trying to work on a, on a uh, juridically speaking, on a new idea of uh, foundation. Mm -hmm. It was called Teatro Valle Bene Comune. Okay, so the, there was this. It was a, a, a real work, a real work on the codes, on the juridical side. So mm -hmm. this also opened uh, open uh, new reflection about how how institutionality is important and how instituent practices are important. So it was it was and it is a process. I would mm -hmm. say. It's interesting that you mentioned that um, because something that I wanted to ask both of you and as a, a sort of provocation, is that if you believe that old institutions or existing institutions, you know, and, and you mentioned neoliberal institutions, and we can think of the museum as the embodiment of colonialism and uh, of all those issues that we're still tackling with, um, should we just let them go all together instead of trying to salvage them and create new institutions like for instance what you did or is there still something worth um 
preserving and trying to change within those own institutions. I believe, Sada, you have a very special opinion because in a way that's what you're trying to do. And Marco, on the opposite, I guess uh, you created this new institution from scratch that you're kind of developing through practicing or through performing it. Uh, so uh, I would be very interested in hearing you both about that. Should I start, Marco? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, in a way, it's what we are trying to do, and but this is like the big, no, the um, the old the the old debate around um, shall we erase everything or, or there is the possibility to to transform. Uh, of course, it always depends on the nature of the institution that even the public ones have very different natures and status, no. But in a way, institutions that, that are you know, the, these dispositives we humans create uh, to run you know, our society are always political and are always uh, atravesados you know, and crossed by many levels of, um, you know, also uh, politically used. For, for example, uh, the other day in International Online, there is a platform, the International this Network of Museums has an editorial platform we published an article um, of an artist and activist uh, in Hungary that kind of make a narration of in the last 10 years, how you know, this new neo-fascist government has been taken every public institution and what were the consequences of that and how the cultural sphere in Hungary had to invent in a way, ways of creating new institutions <laughs> in order to, to survive and in order to exist and in order to have a sphere in which they still have trans local connections with others no? and also produce culture and produce critical thinking in a, in a country which is you know, under, this, uh, uh, under attack by the right forces. No? So I believe um, it depends on the, on the cases. Mm -hmm. that institution, the museums are run by by boards, no, by patronos that are also uh, the ones that legitimate the decision of the artistic no, team as well. So there is a, always a political tension inside and it really mm -hmm. depends on who are your board that uh, if uh, it's on us, it's on that as well, if you are able to go on with the institutional project. So of course it depends on it's situated in no, uh, concrete case, I wouldn't, uh, reject the, like uh, the old institutions are lost, but mm -hmm. there are cases in which they are lost and we have to imagine and to invent other ways to, to operate. Mm -hmm. So, and indeed in, in, in Europe, we are facing this, uh, this we are in cultural wars, no? I'm, like um, Marco mentioned in the, you know, uh, be, before, we are in cultural wars in, in many countries and there are really an attack under mm -hmm. the institutions. So, in a way, we are in a moment in which, in which this also this internationalism or this, uh, inter, this, in this international support also of uh, models of institutions is really important and we really need to reinforce that bonds because we are under the attack every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if, if I may add, I, I think Sara, you, you mentioned cultural wars and, and I mean, I agree. I mean, I don't see I don't see this problem as an alternative between salvaging or letting go. The way I see institutions is that uh, institutions are a battleground. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to take an oppositional stance, and sometimes you're able to make alliances. But the point is when 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 can you make alliances from a point of view of a of a social movement's reality like Saladox? You can make alliances when in those cases, when the space that official institutions give you, a space for, I don't know, political discursive practices, for uh, socially engaged art, etc., is accompanied by an actual interrogation of the institutional structure and the institutional role. If, there is not, if this interrogation is lacking, what we're witnessing is simply like a representation of politics. Mm -hmm. And this is something that happens all the time within the art world. The art world is a very, very effective governmental machine, meaning that 
if if uh, biennials, festivals, museums, but even non-profit art space that, spaces that don't that show political art without, uh, in a way, without positioning themselves, you know, without making an ex an exercise of of positioning, mm -hmm. if you want to use a uh, 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 a feminist uh, vocabulary, uh, then then it is just the. Uh, an eradication of conflict, an eradication of, of dissent. And this is uh, also a, a very big problem when mm -hmm. it comes to, to the relationship between aesthetics and politics today. Uh, I, uh, um, we have Anna Longoni wants to, to, to talk a little bit uh, on Museo Situado, but uh, I will add two questions and then I'll, I'll give voice to Anna. Well, it's not two questions, it's more or less two reflections. Um, I think it's really important to see it as, uh, as you both put it and as Sarah explicitly told us uh, as um, notions of ecologies. So uh, the fact that there is a network of institutions mm -hmm. and one of the things that you, you both share in, in common is the fact that you do have a space, you give space, you give time to others. And this is something, well, I, I thought once I wrote something on Atelier Real a long time ago, and it had to do with that, ter um espaço, dar espaço, abrir espaço. And at, at that time, Atelier Real, which was a, it came by João Fiedani, it was a supposedly a dance space, but at that time it was being curated by David Alexandre Gagnon, who now has a publishing uh, and it's very active in the independent publishing scene, which is a, a really important um, space as well. Um, it had to do with this, with, give, with giving time and giving space and acknowledging for other ways and other practices to, to appear. So I, I think in both cases, it's really important, this notion of ecologies. Another thing I, you both uh, stressed and Sara just told was the, the um, relation to the actual context, the current situation, which is actually... <laughs> Uh, very serious, very, um, and so um, to have an institution uh, allow us to to do things in other ways and to, to have means to act in different platforms. And I do think this is a crucial point as well. Another, uh, on top of this, I would, I would make a bridge to yesterday's questions and uh, to yesterday's presentations in, from my point of view, um, Portugal is a complicated case in, in what it, I do believe in what concerns these institutions. But uh, for instance, I studied um, um, I studied the eighties, but because of that, I went to the long sixties. And you, what you can see is that in dictatorship, there's a there's a whole network of institutions in dictatorship that are acting underground and that they are using their spaces to do a lot of things. Although it is not allowed but so I, I think the um, I, I think it has something to do that that when it actually institutions can open we are in the 80s which is this which is this neoliberal moment very aggressive uh we have Cavaco Silva I mean uh, <laughs> a very very narrow neoliberal uh, moment but still I do believe that there is this there is this tra tradition of this network of institutions that we're acting and we need to, to know more about it. And we need to understand, even because ourselves, we, I mean, <laughs> when I was a kid, there were this Yugoslavian cartoons on the TV because the TV itself was a, was a space for experimentation after the revolution. So there are a lot of things that, that they actually shaped ourselves, but we, we don't see them. <laughs> Uh, sometimes we don't see where do, where do they come from, and when we start scratching, we see that they come from this counterculture. Uh, so this is the relation between the old and the new that Louise was putting. Um, my my final comment, and this these are my questions. I would like you both to comment on um, the current pandemic moment. I would say on institutions now, but also on the um, the fragile position of cultural workers, and I'm thinking explicitly. Uh, on the performing arts. I mean, we are <laughs> at our theater. We we um, we receive food that we give to the network of uh, cultural workers. So it is really a very bad moment for uh, uh, cultural workers and um, um, theater and and cinema and audiovisual in particular. So I, I will I will end here and I will ask Anna to 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 jump in. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, Anna, but what you say of giving a space? Me, me, no. <clears throat> Let's let Anna Longoni and then I'll give you, sorry. Okay, right. I you asking. Okay. Um, bueno, muchísimas gracias por, por la conversación que están proponiendo, que me parece muy valiosa y coincido con Marco, que, que efectivamente las dos experiencias tienen una escala muy, muy diferente, pero sin embargo es muy precioso reconocer las afinidades y también las complicidades que pueden tener ambas experiencias a pesar de su escala tan, tan distinta. Eh, querría lanzar una, una pregunta o una reflexión a Marco en relación a la experiencia de Sale eh, y su, su deriva por eh, el dispositivo de la exposición. Eh, la opción por, ese, por desarrollar ese dispositivo de la exposición. Eh, me preguntaba si esa táctica puede tener que ver con una estrategia de mímesis en medio de una ciudad como Venecia, donde el entorno está sobrepoblado de exhibiciones, eh, una táctica de mímesis para ser parte, aunque una parte evidentemente disruptiva, pero con una táctica de supervivencia en medio de ese contexto, la mímesis como estrategia de supervivencia, o bien se trata más, más de una táctica de disputar de confrontar la forma expositiva para pensar otras formas, otros modos de hacer exposiciones y evidentemente poner el foco de esas exposiciones en aquellas experiencias que están fuera del de relato hegemónico que abunda en, en el arte global que tiene su sede en Venecia. Esa es un, una pregunta. Y luego querría aprovechar esta la preciosa exposición que nos dio Sara, que además me parece muy, muy valioso pensar en estos momentos en que nos detenemos a pensar sobre la propia práctica que estamos eh, haciendo, que muy pocas veces nos permitimos esos momentos más autorreflexivos, y pensando puntualmente en Museo Situado, que es una red bastante joven dentro del museo, es una red junto con la laboratoria, las dos más jóvenes, Museo Situado tiene apenas un poquito más de tres años, eh, pero efectivamente en el, único, el último año de pandemia ha sido tremendamente urgente y necesaria eh, la, la construcción en red que, que se venía haciendo, ese ejercicio de escucha en la asamblea, como lo describió Sara, sobre todo porque el último año ha sido y está siendo tremendamente crítico para muchísima gente que vive alrededor del museo. Un año de hambre, un año sin trabajo, un año de enfermedad, un año de mucho padecimiento. Y ahí es, me parece muy impactante darnos cuenta cómo ese ejercicio de construcción en red realmente hizo que el museo se transfigurara y que hoy no pase día sin que en el museo ocurran cosas muy insólitas para la lógica de una institución como el Reina Sofía, cosas como clases de español para migrantes o eh, una escuela de derechos para personas sin papeles para que puedan responder an ante un interrogatorio policial o eh, eh, una escuela de proximidad que va a tener sus clases el martes que el museo está cerrado al propio museo, por poner algunos pocos ejemplos, ¿no? Eh, en el barrio, al, al museo situado, no le dicen museo situado, sino agujerear el museo, y agujerear el, el museo me parece una metáfora muy hermosa y muy potente de eso que está produciendo eh, este proceso de museo en red, que no solamente trata de pensar el museo fuera de sí, el museo desbordado, el museo que ocurre en otras partes, sino también trastorna y modifica y, y amplía los límites de lo posible de lo que el museo, de lo que puede ocurrir adentro del museo, ¿no? va afectando y alterando esas posibilidades. ¿no? Eh, pienso en, en cuanto a tensiones, eh, eh, sobre todo en dos, por un lado la, la que hablábamos ayer, en nuestra conversación de ayer, entre activismo y museo, esas dos lógicas 
con tiempos distintos, con urgencias diferentes, con modos de hacer tan diversos y cómo eh, muchas veces entran en fricción, pero también la asamblea es un territorio donde se manifiestan muchas veces las fricciones al interior del propio activismo, distintas posiciones dentro del feminismo, o distintas posiciones respecto de, por ejemplo, los bancos de alimentos que han surgido ahora en, en el barrio. Me parece que la asamblea también da, da cabida a, esas, a esos debates al interior del, del, del activismo que muchas veces son muy tensos y muy difíciles. ¿no? Y respecto a esta fragilidad que marcaba Sara, ¿no? respecto de un proyecto encarnado por personas eh, y la vulnerabilidad de estos mm, movimientos que estamos eh, produciendo al interior de la institución y su, y su posibilidad de continuar más allá de las gestiones concretas, yo creo, eh, y lo digo eh, como una confesión personal quizás, bueno, yo en, en dos meses me voy del museo, me regreso a la Argentina, y yo, sin embargo, estoy segura de que el museo situado va a continuar más allá de, de mi estar en el museo, porque efectivamente se ha construido un espacio donde el barrio se siente con pleno derecho a ocupar el museo, el barrio siente que el museo es de todas, y puede ocurrir ahí desde un picnic hasta un taller de danza para empleadas del hogar, o tantas otras cosas que antes no eran imaginables ahí, y creo que ese es un derecho que va a ser indisputable, además de que efectivamente eh, hay mucha gente concreta en el museo, como Mabel, como Sara y como muchas otras, que van a sostener eh, el proyecto en el día a día, ¿no? Entonces, Pienso que, más allá de que el museo situado pueda mutar, pueda variar, pueda tener énfasis diferentes, eh, hay procesos que llegan para transformar una institución y que efectivamente es muy difícil eh, deshacer, aún más allá de las gestiones personales, ¿no? Eso, muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, I wonder who, who of you wants to answer now and to comment on top. Thank you so much, Anna. Anna, you want to go? No, no, you go because... Okay, you okay. so thank you. Thank you, Anna, for the, for the very important questions. Well, uh, uh, concerning the effects of the pandemic, let's, let's stay focused on Venice, but it's something that I, I think it, it is exemplary of a, of a larger situation. So, for example, one, one thing that uh, really describes how public museums uh, uh, reacted to the pandemic is the fact that uh, a few months ago, the civic museums of Venice, so public museums, which are owned by the city of Venice and whose board of trustees is basically put there by the city council of Venice, uh, said that no matter no matter what were the, the, the decisions of the central Italian government, they would have been closed until April, we are speaking of February, and, and this decision was because there were no tourists in town. So that's how bad the situation is in Venice. We're not talking about private museums. We are really talking about the city museums. They decided to be closed because there are no tourists. And the only time they opened during Carnival, it was because the uh, local hotelier association said to the city council, okay, you can open the museums. We have some guests in our hotels. So this fortunately led to, to a reaction of the city, of, of, the, of the workers of the museums. And we, together with, with other groups and the workers of, of the museums, organized a demonstration, which was, which was you know, pretty also participated uh, a month and a half ago. But, you know, that's, the, that's I think, something that gives you an idea of, of the problems we had. Not only uh, uh, these institutions find difficult to rethink themselves in life in light of the pandemic, but they really kind of openly stick to the neoliberal receipt. Second question, the, the workers, and especially the, the workers 
theater workers. They have been mobilizing nonstop for one year in Italy. Because again, even from, from the government, there are no, there are no, not even attempts at answering to this crisis of the economy of cultural events with some alternatives. The only thing is saying, okay, next week we will open, next week we will open, and then comes next week and uh, nothing happens. You know, this, this is, and, and, and the welfare is totally absent. There is absolutely no welfare available for these workers. Uh, only minimal measures. And they've been mobilizing nonstop. Uh, in March, they campaigned for what they called March 2020. So one year ago, one year ago, they campaigned for what they called uh, quarantine income. And now, just these, these, these days, uh, a group of, of theater workers from, uh, from Rome occupied the globe. It is a, a, an open air replica of the Shakespearean um, theater in, in, in London. And they've been making like four days of events, uh, conferences, assemblies, mobilizations. And so the workers are mobilizing. So the struggle is on and, and, and it's worth it to, to follow. And, and then concerning the, the last question, the very, uh, the very interesting question by Anna Longoni. Well, uh, again, it, uh, it was something that we learned. When we occupied the space in 2007, we uh, began by organizing lots of exhibitions and very, very fast exhibitions, you know, one month exhibitions, two month exhibitions, et cetera, nonstop, you know. Then when we, when we understood, you know, the problem of Venice, that Venice lives in a true inflation of exhibitions, we first of all decided to do less exhibitions and to and do and doing more of other things, workshops, trainings, like the one that I, that I show, seminars or mixed formats, you know, formats where uh, exhibitions also have their discursive uh, side that is very relevant and crucial. And, um, and this is something, on the other side, Open6 was exactly the result of a reflection of how not to replicate the, 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 the exhibition as we, uh, always sit in Venice. And that's why we, we went to this idea of, as, of exhibition as assembly, as an open process, as, a, as something that in a way was putting together both uh, curatorial work and the work of, of, of the Museo Situado in the same, same project, let's say. And uh, uh, of course, we also look with interest to uh, exhibitions as as sort of, uh, let's say, a, a sort of, a, to, to, to museum research, to that type of exhibition. So Perder la Forum Humana, for us, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly interesting, in, interesting model. Uh, but this is something that, to be honest, we have still to address concretely. But for example, such an exhibition is for us a model of, of the exhibition we like, you know, it's not based on hype of, uh, fetishized objects, but it's based on the uh, discovery and a certain reading of archive, archival materials. And, and with all that that stands behind that you explained yesterday. Uh, but what is really evident, for example, even not even in Venice, but in the very neighborhood where, where Saleh is placed, is that we have, we have many exhibition spaces. Basically, uh, during the Biennale period, Oh, uh, three or the of the other uh, of the other warehouses that are usually empty host temporary exhibition. The door uh, at, on the right side of Saladox is the door of the Vedova Foundation. It's a public foundation dedicated to an important uh, abstract local painter. And uh, 200 meters on one side we have the uh, the Punta della Dogana, one of the venues of the Pinot Collection. 200 meters on the other side we have the Guggenheim Foundation. But uh, what we see, what we see here, is really like that exhibitions and the art industry is something that is enemy of the life of the neighborhood. So exhibitions are are devices that empty the neighborhood from from life. So we don't want to replicate. We don't want to be, you know, the the, the another space with another exhibition. We we try. We make an effort to. Uh, realize projects that invite people in 
or the exhibitions that are, uh, let's say, that, uh, that can be uh, exhibitions that are one with the idea of an in, in, uh, inhabitable space. The idea that no matter what's inside, the space of Sale remains inhabitable, it's very important. Then it's very difficult because we have no eating and no toilets. It's very difficult, but we, we try. Okay, I, I would answer as well. Have you finished, Marco? Yeah, okay. Um, first, that what the Anna, Anna, what you were mentioning came a couple of ideas to me about this idea of making a space. There are like uh, different dimensions, no? For example, with the with the others, with the comrades, with the networks, with the colleagues we work, of course, uh, is, there is there can be or there is a, a, a logic and, and real and acknowledged asymmetry all the time. It's not the same thing working in Reina Sofia with a regular payment as being an activist in Sale Docs or in Casa Invisible organizing cultural projects. And this is an asymmetry that is uh, also, so to say, uh, there is like a, a way, a matter of redistribution of things. But of course, what we put, for example, no, this is the, the structure of the museum allows us to put certain resources, certain temporality, and certain. And, and this is um, something to to take it all the time. How these asymmetries can be problematic or not. And in terms of in the in, in, in the inside, that this is a, almost a blink to my colleagues working in cultural institutions uh, or whatever they, whatever they are, um, is that as we all know, these hierarchies that come that are inside the institutions many times kind of uh, paralyze the possibilities of the institution to change because there are many sub di different subjectivities working in there. And I can say this, for example, because my experience is starting from below, no? like being a student and pass through different models of relation and also pre precarity with the institution. But when you find out, when you create, and this is something in our department has happened for the last years only, uh, when you are able to create a, a space that is more assembly, less hierarchic, in which everyone can share their their knowledge, their particular knowledge, and at the same level, then the people get <laughs> surprisingly surprised. The people get empowered and then start to contribute in a very different way. And about the um, the question you made, Anna, about the current situation with pandemics, I think it's also important not publicly share these things uh, in these spaces of institutional reflection. That, uh, for example, uh, for us in Spain, the pandemic conditions has, has been different, not because there is less uh, uh, urgencies or the pandemic has a uh, has less consequences, but because the political man management of the pandemics in, in, in the region of Madrid at least pri prioritized since the beginning to open the, you know, the, to save economically the city. So that means to save the bar, to open the bars and to, uh, so the institution Museo Reina Sofia has been open since June in 2020, you know, we have been closed only for two months. When we started working, um, we we realized that was in a way our responsibility as the major institution of contemporary art with really big venues with uh, resources with material resources and so on to create uh, the possibility of having a space of presenciality. So we start to work at two levels that every so to say activity or dispositive we do we do it presentially with the bodies in the space but also online. Uh, no, so caring also about the people that who cannot or who doesn't feel safe or who doesn't want to go to the streets and to come to a museum that can also have the experience of what we were doing. And the reception has been really, really good. Uh, during the pandemic, our activities have been full all the time. Also the people participating in the Zooms, but it also has kind of implement very quick and very uh, uh, difficult internal changes in the in the way uh, you organize things and in the way you take the decisions. And I can say 
two things, for example, uh, about what I was saying that of learning methodologies from the others. We organized a big uh, seminar with La Laboratoria on the on syndicalism feminista, uh, syndicalism, feminist labor in December. That was really the, the first time a lot of uh, feminist activists get together again in a physical space. So there was a request by La Laboratoria that we provide a FPP2 mask to everybody. Why not? No, it's a museum. And we said, yeah, totally. So we start to create an internal protocol that the museum provides, the, the, has the resources and provides the major you know, way of, uh, of, uh, yeah, of protection. And this is something we have learned from that meeting that we are uh, implementing in, the, in our methodologies, no? coming from them. And the second thing would be, for example, with Museo Situado. Maybe just a short question. If the digital, uh, to add on that, uh, didn't represent the proliferation of work with the same stuff, uh, that, uh, that suddenly you had double, double work with the same stuff. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's like doing two activities at the, at the same time with the same team. But we also, you know, reflect on the dispositive with the technicians and so on. And we ask to the, to, we demand the institution to provide more resources. It's, it's, more ex, it's, it's more expensive. You need more people. You need to take care of that. Maybe you do less things. That's for sure. But you, you, do, you need to do it properly. And the last thing very quickly is that, the, for example, during the pandemics with Museo Situado, we understood in a, in a moment that the museum was the only space in the neighborhood that has spaces big enough for the associations to meet, to meet, to do their meetings or to do an activity. And there has been this kind of occupation no, of the institution uh, in this moment in which is the only space that can provide safeness for, for, the, for the neighborhood and for the people we work with. So that has been also a learning from the pandemics really important for the institution and for us. Yeah. Luis, I, I guess you want to. I would, I would just like to, to, to go back to the online uh, conversion uh, of institutional activity during the pandemic, and and it's it, I, I think Sara, you were you were mentioning it in in a really nice way because you never kind of let go of presentiality of of the body in the physical space, but um, most institutions and 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 most of the activities that were presented uh, online throughout the pandemic really abandoned the necessity of the body in a space or the body or the bodies together uh, in actuality in, 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 in a tangible way. Um, and, and of course, depending on how you do that, but there is this institutional sanctioning of that and of that moving forward after the pandemic. And of course, um, it, it, it is, or, or, or under most circumstances, it, it seemed to me that it was the, the, the ultimate denial of us coming together uh, or a, 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 very, a, very, a very different sense of community that kind of, let us be alone while retaining some sense of being together, but still casting us apart. Um, and of course, I, I, not to mention the, the, the labor conditions that, that kind of enforced into an already precarious, uh, you know, community. Uh, that people were invited uh, to thousands of Zooms without getting paid or, or, or people having to work twice as much because they had more things to produce online. And, and I, I don't think there was uh, a reflection on that. It was a kind of a, let's go, uh, let's do it, let's not think about it. And I, I would like to hear you both about it. 
Okay. Uh, I think that every if if this situation becomes like a, a project or something that is close to something final, this this acceleration of digi digitalization, I think this is a, a, a huge problem. I think that every project or dream that foresees the the that that wants to take away the body from the center of the cultural political scene is a reactionary project or dream mm -hmm. in the end. Uh, we could make lots of examples, but think of something that was very fashionable in the art world a few years ago, accelerationism. You know? So uh, at its worst, it becomes like the idea of a prophecy of a uh, digitalized collective consciousness where the body is totally uh, is totally removed and not a democratic one. Mm -hmm. So I think I also think, for example, that not for maybe not so much for museums or biennials, but imagine art schools. Imagine like a, a university system that is based on the on the coming together of digitalization and innovation is the exact contrary of, of, of radical policies. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, is an in, it is a coming back, I think, to a very uh, disciplinary idea of school, you know, where, 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 where the common are denied or at least are much more difficult to organize as, as in comparison to being in presence. So I think, I think that's a, a, a reactionary dream. On the other side, I think that there is something good about it. I think, that, for example, uh, this acceleration of, of the, the possibility to listen to each other. This is something that uh, I think it's very difficult that people uh, would like to, to, to renounce to something like this, to the possibility, for example, of, of listening, of meeting, of speaking with, with, with uh, other people in other corners of the world in, in a way that it's anyway easier than it was before. I don't know if it's more sustainable because I don't know like the ecological costs of this, uh, uh, of the usage of, of, of this amount of internet connection. I have no idea in comparison, but I think that in comparison to flying around, exactly. it's probably, it's probably <laughs> less technology. I, I don't know. So I, I think it's, I think it's, it's ambivalent, but I, so that's why I think that's what we try to do too. So to, of course, to do something online, but to as much as possible to preserve the presence in the space and as much as possible when, when law uh, gave us the possibility to open the space as much as possible to meet with all the safety measures, et cetera. Yeah, mm, well, this is, this can sound a bit, uh, <laughs> Uh, unpleasant for uh, some colleagues, but uh, of course, I think first it depends on the regulations. So it's not the same situation for us that are allowed to be open than for others. But what my personal experience told me, <laughs> tell me that there has been, at least in Madrid, for example, a, complete, a lack of responsibility of uh, people running institutions, uh, institutions with the possibility to work in the presenciality, that they haven't done anything into that. Also speaking with, with colleagues that works in other institutions, in a way, for example, for the team to be together, that we are going to the museum, I don't know, one, two, three times a week, it depends also on each situation, and there is a lot of fluidity on that, and institution allow us, but also there is a possibility to meet and to and to to meet there and to work together and is and that is really and that is real because for example speaking with other colleagues working in other institutions for example in, in international the, the 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 fact that they don't see the team uh, that they don't see the institution is really creating a sort of that the, the institution is an abstraction to which they cannot relate anymore so when to me for example uh, we have this in Museo Situado, we launch a manifesto of the collectives of the neighborhood that went demanding the pu public powers to open the municipal spaces, like for example, the, the municipal centers of women or of migrants that are on, in the neighborhood. 
and that maybe can be used no, with putting me the concrete measures that the space needs, with the aforo, the people that can be held in this. Not somebody has to make this work of translation and, and of care. And somebody's, uh, and there are a lot of institutions that haven't done this, that are, are, are rejected totally. And I think it's a lack of responsibility because yes, it's a lot of work, but that's your role in the institution to do that kind of work, no? And to make possible the institution is a reality. Um, and also what Marco was saying now, and I love this idea of radical permanence you put, because also you know, in, this, in this time of pandemics, to me, I reflected a lot on that, that I used to travel a lot, a lot, no? as, as all of us, every month, one, two places that is so, so, it's devastating for the body, it's devastating for the mind, it doesn't, even if I really enjoy it and I see the, the difference no? of being with the people in their places and understand their situation, their proposal, what the context, and it's really important. Uh, but it was also something crazy that in a way you know, has some logic that, has, that stops. And on what model are we moving you know, when this restart again? And I really wondering about that. And I don't travel for that since uh, October 2019. <laughs> From that, I, from see, and and it's like my life. Uh, but at the same time, every day I see at least 15, 16 people because of this uh, non-stoppable Zoom. No, so I don't know. Let's see the, the or let's appreciate the possibilities. No, the ones, for example, that Marco pointed out. But also, it's like a, we need to start thinking on what is going to happen. No, because it's it's. Yeah, because we need to, to take a position about that, how we are going to reconstruct this art system, in which model. Yeah, but just to make a, just a little example, in a pre-COVID world, this week I would have been uh, Tuesday in, uh, Tuesday in, uh, in Barcelona, uh, Wednesday in Milano, and Saturday and Sunday in, uh, in Lisbon and next next Thursday in Kasrua, you know. So, I mean, of course, I miss you guys. I totally miss you. That's, uh, I would have, you, you asked me, what, what would you choose to be in your little uh, room? Uh, I, I would choose to, to go in each of these places, uh, even if it's tiring, but it's also very, it's beautiful to be together. At the same time, this type of mobility, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm basically no one, you know, I'm, I'm no superstar at all. I'm a, average you know art operator and but this is this is the, the the unsustainable model of mobility in which we were trapped is probably something in between not being relegated to these little screens in in this digital environment at the same time not being you know like shot around like bullets from from one place to to another still anna if you invite me i will come to lisbon <laughs> immediately so <laughs> forget what I, what I just said <laughs> and i and, and i'm thinking of it actually we try we try that um i do believe that in in what concerns the digital uh, theater the Barlot also has a bit of experience because we opened we were at first we started online because the theater had these works that were never um that were never ending so we started online read videos and and podcasts and we and we understand podcasts as a, as a creation and then we, we we were open for six months and we closed doors so it's uh, then we, we had to react to what was going on and in that sense i, I do believe from my personal experience that to, um our uh, digital events have have had up until now different they work differently I think we have some small events and actually that at least my experience, uh, my recent experience was was now during this long lockdown that we had. And so some events are really important because people would see each other. And that was really important to f that there was a place where people could see, even if, um, I mean, even if you, you wouldn't talk on the chat, you would, after all, you would talk and you say, oh, you were there and you shared. it. So some events, I think that they work like that. Some other events were we're more reacting to the actual situation. We made two online projects. Um, we are not uh, shooting um, performances and, and showing them. These performances are really online pieces. 
And so I think there, there has been a DIY experimentation kind of really interesting. And also it acknowledged, um, it allowed us to, to invite people that maybe wouldn't come into the theater otherwise. Uh, I'm thinking of, for instance, uh, one of the first projects was Essenciais on this actual essential workers versus cultural workers where we invited one cultural worker to invite one essential worker to the, make something together, which was kind of, I mean, in the end it were videos, but they were pretty beautiful. It was during the first lockdown. Or um, we had Curfew, another project in December, which was actually, was trying to spend the money we still had because we, <laughs> so we kind of created a last minute project um, also to, so that people, art workers can work. <laughs> so we would give the money back. So, but still uh, I, I acknowledge the contradictions of all of this. And, and I think it's not, I think we, we can have both, but we need urgently to, to reflect upon it on a, on a more sustainable basis. If we are going to continue with the, uh, because, uh, for us, everything changed. For, for instance, our leaflet. Um, now we have almost uh, as many digital projects as um, in presence, but the leaflet is most, I, I mean, the, the, the projects which are in present have more space, but, but often the discursive projects are online, so they need more space. So it's kind of, we always have this contradict that it changes everything on how you think communication on how you think how many workers you need on, or for instance, the fact that I need someone like Nunu who is today here with us, um, helping me because I couldn't be myself doing every, so all of this, uh, or even the fact that Nunu's computer is having some problems, so suddenly I need to jump in and stuff like this. I think we need to think all of this uh, if we're going to continue like this, I do believe. But I think um, it also has possibilities. Uh, and limitations. <laughs> uh, maybe one last uh, thought and we'll finish now. Or one last comments. And... No, I, I was thinking also that on this uh, envision, we are uh, drafting right now one other key thing, and that has to do with what we have discussed all the time would be what um, what will happen in the in the next year with the museums after losing all the visitors no the tourists that were the ones that were paying and putting uh, yeah, so we we have this uh, institutional model that is so based on tourism that now it's really about to to grow no because of the, the cat, fun cats we are going to experience in the next in the next budget. Hmm. I do agree. And that is also for us in Lisbon as well. Uh, yes, it's totally true, actually. Let's we see. Can, we will invent other ways. Hey, uh, I don't know, last thoughts or... So let's, let's continue this conversation in present soon, I hope. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much to everybody for this amazing weekend and uh, have a nice Sunday and have a nice week. Thank, thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.